Romans chapter 5, verse 12 to 21. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, in this way death came to all men, because all sinned. For before the law was given, sin was in the world. But sin is not taken into account when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam, who was a pattern of the one to come. But the gift is not like the trespass, for if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many. Again, the gift of God is not like the result of the one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of, the right, of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Consequently, just as the result of one trespass was condemnation for all men, so also the result of one act of righteousness was justification that brings life for all men. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. The law was added so that the trespass might increase. But where sin increased, grace increased all the more, so that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. This is the word of God. Okay, let's come before the Lord in prayer. Gracious Father, we thank you that uh, in your sovereignty you overrule whatever plans we make and so it's your purpose that we should settle our hearts now. As we open your word, please open our hearts and minds to know what your spirit would say to us as your people today. Father, this is a needful and important lesson today. Help us to listen and to learn, to grow in our knowledge and understanding of your grace. Father, help me to preach faithfully and clearly, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, we come this morning to a topic that may seem at first to be a little bit, how can I put this, boring. A little bit boring. God's covenant with Man, It's not the sort of language we generally go around talking to one another in, is it? It sounds all very old-fashioned and out of date, God's covenant with man. And maybe you're wondering this morning, how, how does this topic help me to be a better parent? Or how does it improve my attitude to work on a Monday morning? How does God's covenant with man intersect with my life, my daily life? So let me start again and I want to share with you an example of why covenants matter. Why do covenants matter? Well, a covenant is an agreement that binds people together under a common cause. Covenants forge strong bonds of fealty and love. So marriage is a great example of a covenant relationship. A marriage binds a man and a woman together in Christ and creates a new family unit. Covenants are life-giving agreements, or they're supposed to be. But the example I want to choose and look at this morning is nationhood. Nationhood. Australia is a federated nation. It is a federation of six states which covenanted together to be a commonwealth. And as you can see on the screen, the word federation comes from the Latin word for covenant, fetus. So federal, federation, we are a covenant nation. We are a federation, same word. And the details of the covenant that binds us together as a nation, as Australians, are found in our constitution. So the constitution is our covenant document. 
And this document defines the founding values of our nation under God, such as the rule of law, free and fair elections and so on. Now, I've been doing a bit of research lately about Aboriginal reconciliation. And the question I want to put to you is this. Should we amend our constitution to acknowledge Aborigines as the original custodians of the land? And I imagine, as I ask that question, you'll immediately have a point of view on that. What do you think? Should we amend the constitution to acknowledge Aborigines as the original custodians of the land? Of the land. Well, here's what I've learnt so far as I've been reading and thinking about a number of issues related to reconciliation, acknowledgement protocols, all of these things. What I've discovered is that the real agenda of those who want us to amend the Constitution is Aboriginal sovereignty, not unity, but sovereignty. What they want actually is a seventh state of Australia, a black state, a state defined by race. What they want is a state where the leaders would be the elders of each Aboriginal tribe by birthright and not by election. They want a new state where Aboriginal laws would operate alongside Western laws. Now, I actually do want to see some form of acknowledgement. I'm thinking through reconciliation. I'm aware of the failings of the past, but I've come to realise we don't want to do this in the Constitution because a covenant, which is what our Constitution is... A covenant can't have two heads. If it does, you'll create a two-headed monster and it'll come back to bite you. You can't have one law for the Aborigines and another for everyone else. Covenants need to have one head if they're going to unify the people. Actually, that's the great value of a covenant. It unifies, but you can't unify under two heads. Our constitution, for example, simply refers to the people. And I believe that's the way it should remain, the people of Australia. So the place to solve these issues is not the constitution. In fact, the problem we now have as a nation is that we really don't love each other as peoples and just allowing Aboriginal sovereignty isn't going to help. If our genuine goal is unity, then don't divide us by race. That would be a huge mistake. A covenant can't have two heads, one for Aborigines and one for everyone else. It reminds me of what Jesus said to his disciples, no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. But sin says, yes, I can. It's another example of the same thing. I can serve money during the week and I can serve God on Sunday. I can serve two masters, especially if one of them is me. But do you really think that you can have dual citizenship in God's kingdom? Do you really think that you can come under two heads as a Christian? Well, Jesus says you can't. You can't be a part-time Christian. You either you are in Christ or you're not. In fact, either you are dead in Adam or you are alive in Christ. So today we're going to look at God's covenant love, which is an exclusive love, a love that binds us together with cords that cannot be broken because it is the love of God extended to us in Christ. And this is how God draws himself to us. He does it by way of making a covenant with his people. And he says, you shall be my people and I shall be your God. And you can hear the echoes of marriage in that, can't you? This setting apart of two people to be one. Or as a Christian community, this setting apart, this is God, you are my people, you are our God. We're in this together. So section one of chapter seven of the Westminster Confession of Faith describes it like this. The distance between God and the creature is so great that although reasonable creatures do owe obedience unto him as their creator, yet they could never have any fruition, that's any enjoyment of him as their blessedness and reward, but by some voluntary condescension on God's part, which he hath been pleased to express, and these are the words, by way of covenant. Our God is a covenant-making, covenant-keeping God. He wants to marry you. He wants to embrace you wholeheartedly and wrap you up and make you his very own exclusively. 
Our God is a jealous God and that is an aspect of his covenant nature. Thomas Goodwin once put it this way. God made two great covenants with mankind. The first was with Adam, the second is with Christ. And he said, there are two men, Adam and Christ, and these two men have all other men hanging on their girdle strings. That's a strange image, isn't it? And these two men have all other men hanging on their girdle strings. What did he mean? Well, he didn't mean that they dressed strangely, although that's the picture that comes to mind. But what he means is that we all belong to one of two families. So Adam is the head of one family and Christ is the head of the other. And one family is out of relationship with God because of sin and still lives according to the flesh. But the other family has found peace with God and now enjoys the blessings of new life in Christ by God's Holy Spirit. So today we're going to see how our lives are bound up in the lives of these two, Adam and Christ as the two federal heads, the two covenant heads of all humanity. We have two heads, two families, two futures. And your future and my future is bound up in one of theirs, not both of theirs, one of theirs, because they are our covenant heads. Either you belong to Adam or you belong to Christ. You can't have it both ways. Either you are dead in Adam or you are alive in Christ. So today I want to look at three things. First of all, the the reign of death in Adam. Then I want to look at the reign of righteousness in Christ. And then I want to bring it all back together. God's covenant of grace is my third point. The reign of death in Adam, the reign of righteousness in Christ. How does this all work out in God's covenant of grace? So first of all, the reign of death in Adam. Now this is about original sin and that's what we also looked at last week. So some of this should be familiar. So just take verse 12 of our passage today by itself and we can see at least three important things about original sin. Notice the first thing is that sin entered the world through one man. And who is that man? Adam, right. And... Having opened the door, what happens next? The second thing is that death entered the world through sin. And then third, death has become a universal power in all our lives because, as Paul says, all have sinned, all sinned in Adam. All have sinned. Now Paul is saying not only do we sin like Adam in disobeying God and doubting his word, but we sin in Adam. So as you can see on the, the screen, there's a picture of Scott Morrison up there. I'm going to use Scott as an example. Scott Morrison is no ordinary Australian. Why? Because he is our Prime Minister. He is our federal head. Now if Scott Morrison as PM declares war on China... Every Australian is at war with China. And if Scott Morrison declares peace with China, then every Australian is at peace with China. In fact, we didn't decide one way or the other, but because he is our federal head, our representative, what he decides as a nation, we are bound up with him in that decision. Do you see how it works? This representative nature of the head, which we as individualistic people sometimes forget, we are bound up in bigger communities. So it's the same in a family. Sometimes the husband or the the wife, the the parent, will make a decision that we as kids think, why, Dad, why, Mum, are we doing this? I don't really like the decision you've made. Why are we moving houses? Why do I have to change schools? Oh, Mum and Dad have made the decision and you're the kids. and You're part of the family unit and you get swept along with the decisions that your parents make. It's the same for us as nations, and it's the same for us as Christians in Christ. Jesus is our federal head if we are Christians. Adam is our federal head if we're not. And sometimes as Christians we like to go and visit our old home, which we shouldn't do, but we do. So this is how it works When you're in a covenant relationship, these relationships, these ties bind us together under a common head. And how much true, how much more true is this of Adam? Because Adam is the father of us all. 
So when he fell, we fell. In the garden, all our eyes were opened and we all became aware of our nakedness. And today we all feel the shame and we feel the fear of God's judgment in our bones. And it's all thanks to Adam, our covenant failing father, according to the flesh. Adam, by his one sin, knocked over the original domino, if I can go to the next screen, in a long line of dominoes branching through time and history, coming to each and every one of us. So there is a domino of death that's got my name written on it and I can see it coming towards me. Ka-chunk, ka-chunk, ka-chunk. There's the grey hairs. It's all getting another day closer. Every time I do the washing up, I think, praise the Lord, that's one less time I have to do the washing up before I die. That's my view of washing up. One less day, one more day closer. The domino is getting nearer and there's a domino with your name written on it too. And we can't avoid it because of Adam. That's the doctrine of original sin. Let me say it one more time. Okay, It's not what we're familiar with. So we've got to try and think, think ourselves into this. Adam is our federal head, our representative, our first original father. And we're all tied to him by birth, by our flesh. He is our Scott Morrison before God in a covenant of works made in the beginning with Adam, which Adam broke. And so all humanity comes under God's wrath because of Adam. And so we read the words, death came to all men because all sinned in Adam. Now this is true even for those who lived in the days between Adam and Moses. In those days, God's law, God's law hadn't yet been given. It wasn't given until Moses came and yet between Adam and Moses, people were still having diseases and wars and dying and, and how come if there was no law that they were breaking? People died without breaking any specific command of God. And Paul explains again, verse 14, it's all Adam's fault. Verse 14, nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam, who was a pattern of the one to come. We're not used to thinking like this, are we? We've got to think about what is happening here. What's happening is that Adam's original guilt has been visited on all of us. All mankind sinned in Adam and fell with Adam in his first transgression. When he jumped into the gutter, he took us with him. Well, what about those who've never heard the gospel? No, all mankind sinned in Adam and fell with Adam in his first transgression. Well, what about people who are severely disabled, who, who can't think for themselves? Oh, All mankind sinned in Adam and fell with Adam in his first transgression. What about babies who die in their infancy? All mankind sinned in Adam and fell with Adam in his first transgression. Now, I'm not saying that such people cannot be saved. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying it won't happen outside the grace of God applied in Christ And God can work in extraordinary ways, but I cannot say anything about the workings of God for those who are outside the covenant community, who are not Christians, who don't honour Christ and make no claim to. This is how very serious sin is. And I think this should teach all of us to take our own sins very seriously. I spoke about this last week, didn't I? Remember that we're all sinners, so we better stay humble. We need to stay humble as we walk through this life. We need to be honest to God and honest to ourselves about our own weaknesses, trials and temptations. And we need to help one another to stay close to Christ, remembering that we're all sinners in Adam. This truth is restated in section 2 of the Westminster Confession of Faith. It says the first covenant made with man was a covenant of works wherein life was promised to Adam and in him to his posterity upon condition of perfect and personal obedience. So if Adam never sinned, there would be no death and uh, all the rest of the narrative of the Bible wouldn't have needed to be written but there was Genesis 3 and after that 
all the problems come in. Adam failed. He disobeyed God. Actually, it was Eve who was deceived. Think of that. And But Adam is responsible. Why is he responsible? Because he's in a marriage and he is the head of the marriage and he didn't intervene. He's responsible as the head. Well, that's the bad news in our passage today, but there's plenty of good news too because of the covenant of grace. Jesus is the head of a new humanity. God hasn't given up on us. Jesus is the true king of righteousness and Jesus fulfills the pattern that Adam failed to keep. So what we need to do, according to the gospel, is to receive Jesus as our new federal head to come under the covenant that God has made with his son Jesus so that we can be part of God's new family in Christ and so come under his righteous rule and receive his benefits and blessings. For wherever Christ is king, sin and death have no power to harm us in eternity. So my second point today is about the reign of of righteousness that comes to us in Christ. So have a look at verse 15. Paul says this, but the gift is not like the trespass. And I want you to just hold those words, hold that thought for a moment. The gift is not like the trespass. Something wonderful is going to happen here, a reversal, a recovery. The gift is not like the trespass. So this is to say Christ is more than able to overcome the deadly consequences of Adam's fall. This is where we come to the gospel, to the good news aspect of what Christ has done for us. For God's plan, it seems, has always been to create a new humanity redeemed by the blood of Jesus. So let's look at these verses now. Verse 15 that the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? How much more? Adam's sin and the consequences were horrendous, but the grace and the recovery that comes in Christ overflows and so much better, so much more. And again, the gift of God, Paul says, is not like the result of the one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification, right with God, reconciled, restored. Adam sinned and we all died. Jesus died and we all live. It's amazing, isn't it? The gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. Right relationship with God. So you are forgiven and declared righteous in God's sight, but this is not because of anything that you have done. It is by grace alone and it is the gift of God to be received by faith and with thankfulness. And so I say here, I want to suggest we should be eternally thankful. We should be thankful people as Christians. You should start the day with prayers of thankfulness to God. You should continue the day humbly before God and fearless before men. And You should do your duty as a Christian. And when the day ends, you should take the time to rejoice in your salvation There's an old song, praise him, praise him. Jesus, our blessed redeemer, sing, O earth, his wonderful love proclaim. He, our rock, our hope of eternal salvation, hail him, hail him, Jesus the crucified. Jesus is the king of righteousness. But we must come under his headship, his federal headship, his representative nature as our king if we want to enjoy the blessings and benefits of his reign. We must all turn to Jesus, the king of righteousness. We must remember those girdle strings that uh, Thomas Goodwin talked about. We need to stop hanging around with Adam. We've got to go and enter into relationship with Jesus. Say hello to Christ. Say goodbye to Adam. So that's my third and final point for this morning. God's covenant of grace. We've seen the reign of death that comes to us in Adam. 
We've heard the good news of the reign of righteousness that comes to us in Christ. Let's bring it all together. Let's see how this covenant of grace is what makes this thing work. This is something that doesn't depend on us. It it depends entirely on God's own faithfulness as the covenant-keeping God. I want to go back to a moment to what God promised Abraham in Genesis chapter 17, verse 7. God says to Abraham, I will establish my covenant, and notice the words, as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you. There's that whole family coming into things. For generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. I shall be your God and you shall be my people. That's the heart of the covenant of grace. God does everything. He opens our hearts and minds, gives us his Holy Spirit so that we're willing and able to believe in him. And so Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And that's how God's covenant of grace has always worked, both in the Old Testament and in the New. In fact, Jesus, in a conversation with the Pharisees, where they're calling Jesus really a son of Satan, (laughs) Jesus calls them out and he says, look, Abraham saw his day and, and rejoiced. And Jesus said, I tell you the truth, before Abraham was, I am. What is Jesus saying there? He's saying that he is God. He is God come to us, extending the hand of grace and forgiveness and hope to us that we might be restored and reconciled with our creator. Jesus is God. So the Westminster Confession talks about this in section 3 of chapter 7. It says, picking up from Adam's failure, man by his fall, having made himself incapable of life by that first covenant, the Lord was pleased to make a second, commonly called the covenant of grace, wherein he freely offereth to sinners life and salvation by Jesus Christ. So we're talking about the gospel. Come to Jesus requiring of them faith in him that they might be saved and promising to give to all those that are ordained unto life his Holy Spirit to make them willing and able to believe. Now there's a lot in there. I just want you to focus on the covenant of grace that comes by salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. What this means is the wonderful news that the law is unable to kill us if we're in Christ. The law threatens death, but grace prevents it. Perhaps a better way to put it is to say that grace overcomes the law. So that even though we do die in this world because of our former attachment to Adam, but we know that God will raise us again in Christ, in the new creation. Jesus is the glorious Christ in whom there are infinite reserves of God's grace. You can't outspend Jesus when it comes to God's bank account of grace. God's grace is limitless and Jesus is able to save you completely if you put your trust in him. So come down to verses 18 to 20 of our passage. I'll show you where this idea leads us. If you're an accountant, just think of a general ledger, how a general ledger works, debits and credits. Sin is the debt that we owe but cannot repay. We have smashed up God's world and we cannot fix it. Remember once writing off a car that wasn't mine. I didn't have any income. Sin is a debt that we owe but we cannot repay. How can we fix God's world now that we've broken it? Only Christ can cancel the debt of sin by applying his own righteousness on our behalf. So on the debit side in verse 18 we see that Adam's one trespass brings condemnation for all men. So Adam maxed out the entire bank account on day one. 
Verse 19, Adam's one act of disobedience made many sinners. That's us. So in verse 20, Paul summarises, the law was added so that the trespass might increase. God wants to teach us that we cannot repay the debt ourselves, no matter how hard we try. How then can we be saved? Well, we need someone to cancel our debt, don't we? Look on the credit side. Jesus' one act of righteousness brings life for all men. Jesus' one act of obedience makes many righteous, as we are today in Christ. So in verse 20, Paul summarises again, where sin increased, grace increased all the more. You cannot outspend Jesus when it comes to God's grace. But there's one more point that I mustn't overlook before I finish today. The question is, what did it cost Jesus that he could offer this salvation to us as a free gift? Well, it cost him everything. On the cross where Jesus died, the Father turned his face away. What a mystery. And God poured out his wrath on his own son as if Jesus was nothing but a rebel and a lawbreaker. Jesus died for you personally, in your place, to cancel the debt that stood against you. He offered his own life, an atonement for sin. That's what atonement is. So that you might have peace with God and become his child, redeemed and adopted into this new family where Jesus is the head and done all by grace. That's why I love the words in the final verse, verse 21. They are profoundly true. But grace increased all the more so that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that is the gospel. Jesus has done what we could never do. He outgraced sin. He outlived death. And that means that the way of the cross is unavoidable. People say, why did Jesus have to die on the cross? Well, it's for you. And the debt that you owe to God that cannot be repaid by any other means except the sacrifice of a human life. Because of the death penalty that we deserve. And that's why God's covenant of grace is often set forth in the scripture as a, as a kind of last will and testament, knowing that the Messiah had to suffer so that God's grace could then be poured out like a, a river from the tree of life, which is the cross where Jesus died. The tree of life in the Garden of Eden becomes the cross on which Jesus dies and we see it growing in the new creation, alive with blessing. Section 4, chapter 7 of the Westminster Confession of Faith puts it this way. The covenant of grace is frequently set forth in the scripture by the name of a testament in reference to the death of Jesus Christ, the testator, that's the one who dies, and to the everlasting inheritance with all things belonging to it therein bequeathed. The blessings that we enjoy come at the cost of a death. Do you appreciate your inheritance? Or do you take it for granted? A testament is a covenant that comes into effect when you die. Jesus had to die to release the inheritance for you. So God's will has not changed. As we follow the story in the Bible from Adam to Noah to Abraham to Israel to Moses to David and to you and to me, through Jesus, God's will is to judge sin and to save sinners that we might know him and love him and serve him and glorify him as the Lord of life. So we see that the covenant of grace is at work in the Old Testament as well as the New. Often when we talk of the covenant of grace, we think it only means the New Testament. But no, the covenant of grace covers the Old Testament and the New Testament. In fact, this is a very distinctively Presbyterian understanding of the covenant of grace. We don't divide the testaments, the old and the new. 
But we see that the covenant of grace, God has always saved his people by grace. And there are two administrations of the one covenant under the administration of law and under the administration of the gospel. But through the centre of God's dealing with mankind, there is, as it were, Ross was saying, a spine that gives us backbone. And the covenant of grace is the backbone that helps us to stand firm in our faith. He gives backbone to his people through the covenant of grace. And one of the things that we've lost as Christians, I fear, is a a failure to comprehend the depth and beauty and wonder and power of the covenant of God's grace. And so we're robbed of that spine, that backbone, to stand in uncertain times and have the courage of our faith. This is deep truth. And I know it's challenging, but I hope you're coming along with me. All believers, no matter when they lived, are saved by grace and not works. This allows us to bring the whole Bible together in Christ. We do not set the Old Testament and the New Testament against each other as if law and gospel are opposed to each other. No, they belong together as two parts of the same story by which we learn to worship and enjoy our God. So today, whether you're reading the Old Testament or you're reading the New Testament, you should look for signs of God's grace wherever it is that you're reading, wherever you are. And trust me, it can be really helpful as you read your Bible. It will enrich your faith if you're looking for those evidences of God's grace the signs that point us to Christ. In the Old Testament, you should look for the promises, the Passover, the temple sacrifices, the priesthood, the kingdom of God and the foreshadowings of David as promises that point forward to Jesus. In the New Testament, you should look at Christ himself, his words and deeds, which fulfil every promise of God that was made in the Old Testament. So finish then. I want to come back to where I first began. Today we've been on a grand tour of a very important topic and one that stretches us, I know, God's covenant with man. And we've seen how important covenants are because covenants are agreements that form bonds of fealty and love that unify us together as a people, as a family. How does this help me to be a better parent? How does this improve my attitude to work on a Monday morning? I want to suggest a couple of answers to those questions as I close. First of all, to you who are parents, you know, first of all, that your marriage is a covenant relationship, don't you? So, Dad, are you not the federal head of your family, of your children and of all your descendants after you? What a responsibility a great responsibility before God and a privilege to represent Christ in your family. And mums, you're there to be his helper, to support him in that all-important role. And God knows our families need strong, faithful husbands and men, don't we, in a world that doesn't understand marriage, doesn't know what it is to be a man or a woman doesn't understand any of these things, thinks, oh, God is love and that will answer everything. Well, what kind of love does God show us? He shows us covenant love. Do you read your Bible with your kids every day? Do you make faith in Jesus more important than exams and studies? Do you confess your own failings as a father and point them to Jesus and say, look, I'm here, but really we all need Jesus. You, my child, are a gift from God and I love you so much. The decisions you make as a husband affect your family for generations to come because you are a federal head. Man up, dads, I encourage you. I urge you to bring your life and heart under Christ for in doing so you will bring your whole family under Christ's blessing. Each one of us must make our peace with God and parents have a particular responsibility to lead their children to faith in Jesus Christ. Covenants matter. Secondly, for those of you who struggle to look forward to work on a Monday, oh boy, didn't I used to be in that category. Remember that Jesus went to the cross to purchase your life in his blood. 
If he can do that for you, can't you get your attitude right to work? I know work can be hell sometimes, but Jesus went to hell for you. You're an ambassador for Christ wherever God puts you and he's put you there for a purpose. What is that purpose? How are you going to represent Christ in your workplace? Turn it around and look at it as an opportunity. Remember the pastor I prayed for, that guy who just set up an online Christian bookstore. He's in jail for seven years and God knows some of us might be in the next few years in jail because we put our hand up for Jesus. Well, get ready. More positively, look for evidences of God's kindness for God is a kind and gracious God, a covenant-keeping God and he will definitely show his faithfulness to you. Look for those signs of grace and be encouraged. And finally, to all of us, just remember that how Jesus has outgraced sin. So whatever things you're struggling with, well, those things come from Adam. We need to keep coming back to Christ, our covenant head, where grace overwhelms sin. We need to put sin to death. We need to say goodbye to Adam and hello to Jesus. The covenant of grace is the backbone of our faith. It is a great, anxi- a great antidote to anxiety and we are living in uncertain times. So I urge you to just meditate more on the covenant of grace by which we stand in a very uncertain world. All around us is sinking sand, but there is a rock and that rock is immovable and his name is Jesus and the covenant of grace anchors us to him through cords of love that cannot be broken. And so we, ho- we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And as we do that, we're going to celebrate one of the covenant signs the Lord's Supper. In the Lord's Supper, the body and blood of Jesus is represented to us with bread that we can hold and wine that we can drink in order that we might, as it were, lay hold of Christ by faith and renew our hope and joy and confidence in him. So I'm going to ask the elders to come forward now who are helping with the Lord's Supper. We're going to continue moving from the preaching of the word to the receiving of the word in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper.